Hey, what's up, everybody? Coach E here with Dr. Dr. B for Ask Dr. B Live. Welcome. And today we've got a great one. Doc, how are you doing today? Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm really excited for today's show because um, I get to bring out the science geek and uh, my clinical expertise. And, and I think we'll really shed some light on some important questions for people who have uh, meniscus pathology. So I'm excited. Yeah. I mean, it's a question that I get so often, um, which is, should I get surgery for this problem that I've been diagnosed with? And when you sent me this study the first time, which was maybe a month ago or so, um, it was really eye-opening and it was great confirmation that uh, the approach that we're taking and that we've, we recommend to people is the first one that you should actually probably take for a problem like meniscus tears. And I know you're gonna get into other issues uh, as well that are, are very related. Um, so before we get into Dr. B's presentation today, I just want to remind everybody, uh, if you've got a question for us, leave it in the, in the chat and Yusuf and, and or Josh will, will take care of it in the back end there. And also, uh, we just launched the knee recovery program. So if you do have any problems with your knee, whether it's meniscus tear, ACL tear, um, patellofemoral pain syndrome, any of the general knee problems that most people get diagnosed with. Um, there's a link down in the description, but we're also going to talk about that. And now is the best time to get in on that program because it's on sale for another few days. So uh, I think that's about it for the intro. So Doc, why don't you take it away? Awesome. Let me get my screen sharing, get my slides up. Okay, so um, today we're talking um, primarily about uh, meniscus pathology and do I need surgery? And uh, actually the topic um, came up partly because I did read this article, um, but it was kind of apropos because Eric and I have been working on this knee recovery program. So um, I wanted to share this um, study with everybody and um, and why I think it's so relevant and important. So what we're gonna do is review just what a meniscus is and why they tear, uh, what the best treatment options are for meniscal tears and, and how you may know whether or not you're a good candidate or not for surgery. And then in general, what you can do to optimize your knee health. So just as a reminder, um, the meniscus is a fibrocartilaginous disc. Uh, it sits between the thigh bone. We're looking here at the bones of the knee. So this is the, thigh bone or the femur, and this is the lower leg bone or the tibia, and the uh, meniscus sits between the thigh bone and the uh, lower leg bone. And you can see on cross section, it's kind of triangular in shape. And if we look down on top of it, you can see that they're C-shaped and there's two of them. There's one on the inside that we refer to as the medial meniscus and one on the outside that's the lateral meniscus. So there are shock absorbers and secondary stabilizers, and their main function is to distribute the load that your knee experiences with everyday life and well, with all life. <laughs> so if you lose the meniscus, the problem is um, you will lose that load sharing effect and you're gonna have increased wear and tear on the, on the joint surface. Um, so the joint surface or the articular cartilage which uh, coats the end of the bones and allows the joint to glide rather frictionlessly um, will be at risk for damage if a meniscus is torn. So that's why they're so important. And if we look here, I want you to just notice that there is really an interesting structure to the uh, meniscus. There's what we call a red zone, which uh, involves the outer uh, quarter uh, of the meniscus and then the inner uh, three quarters or white zone. Um, the white zone has no blood supply and the red zone has a blood supply. And this is really important for us as surgeons in making decisions about how we manage a meniscus tear, because if you try to put a suture in the white zone, it's not going to um, work because there's no blood supply bringing in healing factors so the meniscus can't be repaired. Um, and actually the blood supply and the region of uh, availability of, um, of healing um, potential decreases as we age. So under the age of 30, 
the, the red zone probably represents one third of the outer edge of the meniscus compared to over the age of 30 and unfortunately gets progressively smaller as we age, it, it diminishes to a quarter of the outer edge. So that's why age plays an important role in how we manage meniscus tears because there's less uh, red zone and less potential for healing. So why do menisci tear? Uh, there's two main reasons. One is traumatic injury. Um, and these are most common in young men in their 20s and 30s. And often these are through the red zone. Uh, you get a tackle. You can see in this picture here that the, um, the athlete who's carrying the ball, his leg is bent, his foot is planted, his knee is twisting, and then he's got this valgus force with the guy landing on it. He's at risk for a knee injury. So uh, this is a very common mechanism for traumatic injury to uh, the meniscus. The uh, other and probably most common mechanism for uh, meniscus tearing is wear and tear, degenerative tearing that is associated with repetitive movements in life, with work, with sport uh, and everyday living. Repetitive bending and twisting movements in particular, stair climbing, these kind of things can um, put extra load on the meniscus. And um, I think that the knee is one of the most commonly, um, uh, one of the most common joints to wear out because of its position in our body. And I like to look at the body as alternating segments of mobility and stability. So if we start at the foot, at the toes, our toes are mobile, our midfoot is stable, the ankle is mobile, the knee is stable, and the hip is mobile. So the hip and the ankle are supposed to provide the mobility to perform an action, and the knee is the stabilizing segment. If we lose mobility in the hip and the ankle, uh, for example, people sit in their office and they work 40, 50, 60 hours uh, a week, and then they go and they, they do the weekend warrior routine, and they've got stiff hips from sitting around then what happens is that they're putting extra pressure on their knee and they don't even know it. And it's not something that's going to happen suddenly, but it happens accumulatively. And that's why the incidence of degenerative meniscus tears goes up with each decade in life. If we were to look at the general population, 25% of the population between the age of 50 and 59 will have a, men a, a degenerative meniscus tear. And that number goes up 10% between 60 and 69 and then uh, another 10%, up to 45% of people will have a degenerative meniscus tear between the age of 70 and 79. And they may not even be aware of it. Um, this incidence of meniscus tears dramatically increases if you actually have arthritis as well. And so a person who is in their 50s or 60s and um, suffers from degenerative arthritis, the chance of them having a degenerative meniscus tear is 50 or 60 percent and it goes up um, the percentage of that goes up with each decade so they're incredibly common and i think this is why it's so important that if you're having symptoms in your knee and you have an mri uh, you go see your doctor and they think oh it's a meniscus let's scope it you've got to really a make sure that the meniscus is what's causing the symptoms and after hearing this talk and reviewing this research study you may uh, kind of put your hand up and say, no, thank you, uh, to surgery. Um, so there's different types of meniscus tears. Um, here's the normal meniscus sitting on the top of the tibia. This is the lateral meniscus, the medial meniscus. And then here is a tear that's longitudinal. And this would be considered kind of at the junction of the red and the white zone. And what can happen is that the meniscus fragment here can flip. If you look at this top of the tibia here, imagine that it's a bucket and that the meniscus is a handle and you are gonna take the handle of the bucket and move it to the other side. What can happen with uh, this fragment of the meniscus is that it'll flip just like a bucket handle. And that's why we call it a bucket handle tear of the meniscus. But what happens when that uh, fragment flips, the displaced piece can get caught around the femoral condyle and it locks your knee so that you can't straighten your knee. And this is a big problem. Uh, there's two reasons I think it's a problem. One is that if you walk around on a bent knee or a locked knee, and you're going to potentially be damaging the fragment of the meniscus and make it almost impossible to repair it, you'll eventually 
what will happen is this, this will tear, this front or anterior aspect of the tear will completely tear. And then the other thing that happens is that you, you can, um, the, the pressure from that meniscus fragment that's flipped can damage the articular cartilage on the, on the femur. So if you have a locked knee uh, from a bucket handle tear, that's not a good thing. Don't walk on it, get some crutches and you do need to see your surgeon. Uh, radial tears that go through the white zone uh, are um, very common. They're more degenerative in nature and these generally don't heal and we'll discuss possible surgical management. And then we have more horizontal or flap tears, uh, again, primarily through the white zone and these are degenerative in, in nature. So there's different patterns that we see as surgeons to these meniscus tears. And um, we'll discuss how we manage them surgically um, possibly. Uh, so the, th the three basic treatment options are don't do surgery, um, do physical therapy and exercise. Uh, to do arthroscopic partial meniscectomy. So if we look at these um, radial type tear, uh, the surgical procedure would be to go in and just resect that little piece of unstable piece of meniscus so that you're left with a little defect um, to prevent that meniscus fragment from flipping into the joint or from the tear extending. Um, and then the second surgical procedure is arthroscopic meniscus repair, where uh, the um, tear is through the red zone, where there's a potential for healing. And so we can put sutures through the meniscus and um, uh, stabilize the tear so that the body can heal the uh, injury. So the indications in my mind for surgery for meniscus tears are these traumatic tears with uh, locked knees, bucket handle tears with locked knees. And um, at the time of surgery, we use a, a, an arthroscope. It's a fiber optic scope. Uh, we can examine the whole interior of the knee. You can look at the anatomy of the tear. You can see whether it's through the uh, red, junction of the red zone, white zone, or more in the red zone. We tend to repair those that are um, through the red zone. And the younger the person is, the more um, aggressive we may be with trying to repair the uh, meniscus uh, to try and preserve the function. Because we know that if you lose the meniscus, you're losing that load distribution function of the meniscus and that equals developing arthritis over 20, 30 years. So we wanna try and preserve the meniscus if we can. Um, trauma, uh, so traumatic tears without a locked knee through the red zone in a younger uh, patient are uh, indications for surgery. And um, anyone who has an associated ligament injury with um, tears through the red zone should be uh, repaired. It's very common to have anterior cruciate ligament injuries and uh, meniscal pathology. Uh, sometimes the tear in the meniscus is not repairable, uh, but while you're in there fixing the uh, ACL. Uh, if there's a large unstable fragment of meniscus, um, I would recommend having it removed. Uh, who shouldn't we do surgery in? If you have arthritis in your knee, you shouldn't be having a scope. Um, I, we, we can't put cartilage back on the end of the bone. We can't restore articular cartilage with an arthroscopy. So that is very clear. Actually, I think OHIP, uh, that's in Canada, um, they've stopped paying for the procedure. And even in the US, um, they've, stopped, they've stopped paying for these procedures. The big question that I had in my mind as a surgeon is what about the individual who has a degenerative meniscus tear, but they don't have arthritis in their knee? And, um, and is it possible that that meniscus fragment is flipping in and out of the joint and maybe doing damage to the articular cartilage and accelerating the development of arthritis. And um, that's a question I had. And, and that's where this study um, that is, um, I, I think, so important. Um, and uh, it's called Arthroscopic Partial Meniscectomy for Degenerative Meniscus Tear, a five-year follow-up of placebo surgery controlled uh, trial. And this is done in Finland. And um, it was a really well-designed study. So basically um, what the uh, investigators did 
um, was to involve a number of hospitals in Finland. And this is important because if you just have one surgeon who's doing the procedure, you could have a really good doctor or you could have a really bad doctor and that could make the uh, results skewed um, based more on the performance of the surgery than the actual surgical procedure. So if you have multiple doctors involved in the study that makes the results of the study stronger. Uh, it's randomized, meaning that the doctors and the participants didn't have a choice in which treatment arm they went into. And the, um, the doctors and the patients didn't know how they were treated. So they didn't know if they were treated with uh, the partial meniscectomy or with just the placebo. And uh, when I first read this multi-center randomized participant and outcome assess assessor blinded, I thought I was going to Starbucks and ordering, <laughs> ordering some kind of a drink. It's such a mouthful, but um, it's actually really well done. So they had 205 people uh, in a, a number of centers in Finland, 45 of them were excluded. And it's interesting to me that 18 people that they thought had a meniscus tear that were going to need surgery actually became as asymptomatic before they actually had the surgery. So that's interesting. Uh, not quite a few people didn't want to participate in the study. Um, and then two developed a locked knee and the surgeon said, okay, you need to have surgery. So you're out, you're out of the study. So then they would take the people to the operating room and do a diagnostic arthroscopy. And there were a number of people that were also excluded. They had the wrong diagnosis. There was no meniscus tear in, in six of them. And um, two then had a, a meniscus tear that needed a repair. And then there were five that had a form of arthritis. And so they were excluded from the study. And I think this is important that we're, we've got a group of people that don't have arthritis and have a meniscus tear. So you now have 160 people, they're in the operating room and it's like, can we have the envelope please? So what happens is a, that as part of the study design, there'll be groups uh, and uh, there'll be, the surgeon will be handed an envelope, um, actually probably the scrub nurse because the surgeon's got sterile gloves on, but, um, and they open it up and they say, okay, this patient is having the arthroscopic partial meniscectomy and this patient uh, or this patient is just going to have the scope, which you've actually already done. So then they just kept the person in the operating room for the same amount of time so that the person didn't have a clue. And then from that moment on, they were treated identically and they had uh, 70 in one group and 76 in the other. And then they measured these people um, after their surgery with true criteria, one was looking at their pain and functional outcome uh, from the procedure and the other was looking at the radiographic progression of arthritis. And um, basically what they found was that arthroscopic partial meniscectomy provided no more benefit for knee symptoms or function than placebo surgery. Arthroscopic partial meniscectomy was associated with a slightly increased risk of developing radiographic knee osteoarthritis at five years after surgery. And when you look at the numbers, it's a fairly small number. It's about 12% more. And what the, they did is they had, radi they had radiologists who were blinded. They didn't know what procedure the patient had had. Rate, rate the progression um, on x-rays over five years, which is quite a lengthy study uh, for this type of uh, problem and um, document the progression. And um, this actually corroborated a body of evidence that was already out in the literature where uh, people and surgeons had done unblinded randomized studies uh, suggesting that there was an increased risk for developing knee arthritis after arthroscopic partial meniscectomy. And uh, these other studies had shown that people who had the arthroscopic partial meniscectomy were more likely to have further corrective surgery, either an osteotomy, which is where you realign the bone in the leg to try and take the pressure off a of part of the joint that's deteriorating, or they had total knee replacements. And I think that, you know, we have to have not only the surgeons being aware of these results, but patients have to be aware of these results, that it's very important that the doctors and patients recognize the limitations of arthroscopic partial meniscectomy, and that really we shouldn't be offering this procedure for people with degenerative, osteo or degenerative meniscus tears. So what can you do to optimize your knee health? And this 
uh, is where Eric and I come in. This is our philosophy. It's, it's making sure that you have a foundation for movement. It's making sure that you've got a well-aligned uh, joint, that the tissues are pliable, that you're using the correct muscles, and that you're able to put it all together to have this solid foundation um, for then building endurance, strength, power, and speed as you go about your activities. Um, one other factor that I'm just going to mention because it, it's come up a lot for patients with degenerative meniscus problems and degenerative osteoarthritis is the body mass index. And you can actually go online and get a calculator and figure out what your BMI is. Uh, a lot of, I think most of the patients in this study had a, a BMI over 25, which is considered high. Uh, normal is between 18 and 24.9. So you know, they're a little bit on the high side. Um, certainly there's a lot of studies for patients with degenerative arthritis um, out there that body mass index is uh, a contributing factor to overload of your knees. If you think of, about the fact that two and a half times your body weight goes through your knees with every step, if you can decrease the load that you're applying to your knees by decreasing your weight, then that is going to have a beneficial effect. Or you have to have to take another tactic. If you can't decrease your BMIs, you have to build your strength so that the muscles can protect the joint and support the joint so that they can tolerate the load. So Eric and I have um, designed a knee recovery program and I'm really excited about this program. I think that it's, um, it's great because it can help anybody who is struggling with a painful swollen knee. And this isn't just for meniscus tears. This is for patients who may have early arthritis of their knee, uh, to moderate arthritis of their knee, uh, an acute ACL tear where you, you're, you, you um, hyperextend your knee, you have the pop, your knee fills up with blood, you've got a painful swollen knee. This is a great program to get you through the initial stages of the injury uh, or a meniscus tear or patellofemoral problems. Any any uh, pathology that's related to wear and tear can benefit by this uh, program. And you may wonder, well, what, how, how is it possible that you can treat all of these different programs um, or, or pathologies with the same program? And it's because you have to establish a foundation for movement, no matter what your pathology is. So whether you've got arthritis of your knee or an ACL tear or a meniscus tear, You've got to get balance of the soft tissues, you have to get the right muscles firing, and you have to get them uh, working in the correct order in order to restore your range of motion. So in the end, if you have an ACL tear and you go through this program, you, you may end up having surgery, but it, this program will prepare you properly to recover from the operation because you won't have a painful stiff swollen knee when you go into the surgery. And you'll already understand what you uh, can do for your, for your post-operative recovery. You can, and you can follow this program for your post-op recovery. And actually, I just read an article yesterday, which I was quite excited about, that showed that patients who were going in for total knee replacements who did prehab got out of the hospital faster than people who had not prepared. And I, I think um, this is really exciting. Um, I, have, uh, I have a big question mark in my mind for what their prehab was. I think we can make it, make these programs. Well, I think we have made a program that's excellent because we address a lot of the issues that are neglected in most of the um, quote unquote exercise programs because we deal with the foot and the ankle and the hip in addition to um, giving you exercises to restore the pliability of the tissues around the knee and get your muscles firing properly. Now, I, as you've, you can see from today's talk, um, I'm a big believer in, in science and I know Eric is as well. And we thought that it would be um, good to put our program to the test. And so what we're asking participants um, uh, for this program is, is to do a survey. And this is a validated study, uh, a validated research questionnaire that um, has been used by many different universities um, and what we want to do is to really assess the knee recovery program by looking at knee symptoms and function over the course of the program. So it's a short-term study. This isn't a five-year study like the other program, but we want to see if we can actually 
have somebody who has pain and swelling in their knee, then we have an intervention, which is our program. And then we uh, reevaluate at the end of the program to see if the intervention was effective. And we're really hoping it's effective. We believe it's effective or we wouldn't have put it together, but Eric and I are really keen to learn um, what, what happens with this. And the, the KUS study, KUS stands for Knee Injury and Osteoarthritis Outcome Score. So we chose this survey because it encompasses many different pathologies. It's not just meniscus specific. It's not just arthritis specific. And it also breaks down um, your complaints into uh, symptoms such as swelling, pain, stiffness, locking, and, and function. So we're going to be interested to see if people, A, improve from the symptom side standpoint, um, but also if they don't necessarily improve from the symptom standpoint, do they improve functionally? So there's a whole bunch of information that we can tease out of this questionnaire. And um, we're very excited to start with this. And this isn't going to be comparing, um, we, we're, we're, we're going to be basically proving this as an intervention of exercise. And um, it's a start for us in, in our research careers with our program. So um, that's where I kind of wanted to leave things off today, guys. Um, you know, I think we should open things up for questions. I'm hoping that there's loads of questions out there and um, we'll go from there. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. B. Thank you for putting that together and sharing that with us and breaking down the study. Uh, I think it was after reading it, it, I agree, it was a really well done study. Um, you don't see that kind of study over that time period for meniscus tears or these kind of issues uh, very often. So it was awesome to see. And uh, yeah, let's get into some questions. So we've got a ton of questions, actually. <laughs> I meniscus, was expecting that. That's good. Yeah. Meniscus tears are so common. And, you know, I've, I had a meniscus tear. Um, it was one and a I can't even remember when that was now, almost two years ago, something like that. Um, and I had the, before I, we get into the questions, I just wanted to make one comment on that is that I had in the two, let's call it two years in the two years, I've had one flare up where, and that's when we were playing tennis, oh, right? I, well, I re-aggravated it, but I flared it up playing tennis and then I re-aggravated it because you were running me around the court. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to point that out for people is that, that might happen. You might have flare-ups of an injury, even though it's, you know, I did my rehab and I was doing all my strength and conditioning stuff, no problem. Um, and I was good to go for a year and a half or, or more. And then I had that little flare-up with a fairly innocuous movement. Like I was just landing from a serve, a tennis serve. Um, but just to know that that might happen and it's not the end of the world. You might get a recurrence, but just know that just another bump in the road, the path that I was on all the exercise and all the things that I did. I just got back on it. I did the same thing. And I'm at the point now, again, where I'm at like 97% of my full uh, passive range of motion. I have full active range of motion, uh, but my old passive range of motion, I'm just missing a last little bit. And uh, I'll talk about that in a sec because I saw a question related to that where I could share some exercises that I did and I am doing right now to regain that last couple degrees in, of passive range of motion. So let's keep that in mind, folks. When you have a meniscus tear, uh, you might have relapses or flares, uh, but it's, it's fine. You can get back over it. Don't let it, don't let it bring you down. You know, and Eric, I think it's common for every pathology, uh, you know, someone with arthritis in their knee, they can be going along and everything's phenomenal. Like it's amazing to me how you can actually have fairly significant arthritis in your knee and function without any pain or swelling. And then something happens. And the key is to learn how to nip it in, nip that pain and swelling in the bud. And you get your, your go-to program and you can get back to your activities really effectively. So you're right. Cool. Okay. So let's dive into the questions here. We've got okay. I had a list of 14 and counting. So Ooh. we'll try and get as many as we can. So the first one up is from Rizwan. Now Rizwan question is, how can the degeneration of meniscus be cured or stopped? Okay, so that's a great question. And to me, we have to think about why was the meniscus degenerating? 
And most often it has to do with overload of the meniscus. So um, what I say to myself is, okay, if we're overloading it and we're tearing it, how do we, how do we stop overloading it? Now there's certain factors that you're not gonna be able to manage. Like a lot of people, um, the alignment of their knees. So some people are in varus, a little bow-legged, they're more likely to get um, a medial meniscus tear. Um, but you can do an osteotomy. That's where they actually break the bone and they realign your leg. Um, and I, I'm not recommending that, but what I am recommending is doing all of, all of the things that we've talked about is optimizing foot and ankle function and mobility, optimizing hip mobility, particularly internal rotation and strength so that you're not um, overloading that medial meniscus. And if you've had recurrent episodes of inflammation associated with the degenerative tear, then some of the tissue um, around the medial meniscus will stick together. So the hamstrings, we call it the PEZ. There's a group of them that are close to the medial uh, collateral ligament, close to the medial capsule. And the meniscus itself sits on that capsule. So if those tissues get really tight, what you wanna do is make sure that you're mobilizing those tissues with active self myofascial release so that the tightness of the hamstring in that area isn't actually pulling the meniscus into an awkward position between the femur and the tibia so that it's wearing more. So you may not be able to um, stop the degenerative process or sorry, allow the, allow the meniscus to heal because there's a poor blood supply, but I believe you can stop the degenerative process. And if it, the degenerative process is only in the periphery, I do think it can heal and stabilize where there's a blood supply. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. And uh, it reminds me of the, the story I had where it's not meniscus, but the dancer, my, uh, a parent at my daughter's school, her mother had been told that she had no cartilage in her knees from, a, from imaging. And she was told she had to get a knee replacement. And the, the lady basically said, why do I need a knee replacement? I have no symptoms. Like I have no pain. I work out, I exercise all the time. I feel great. Why should I do that? And um, so you can have the worst looking imaging, x-rays, MRIs, whatever it is. But if your body is functioning well, you know how to move, you have build up strength, endurance. Like you said, you go up the pyramid, strength, endurance, power, speed, depending on your activities. Uh, you can be completely pain-free with the worst x-ray in the world. So we're going we're gonna to cover a lot of these questions because we have a bunch of MRI and imaging questions here. So just also wanted a little comment that I, I wanted to make um, because that story sticks out in my mind so well. Okay, so uh, next up we have New India. Does a long posterior horn tear require surgery? So uh, longitudinal posterior horn tear. Uh, how old? How old? Um... Do we know how old? Do not know yet. Uh, maybe, we can, maybe they can tell me how old they are. Um, if it's a longitudinal, it depends on the length of the tear. So longitudinal tears are often at the red white zone or in the red zone. If the tear is very small, so say it's like five millimeters, then there's no instability and that meniscus fragment isn't going to be moving so that the tear could actually heal. If however, the tear is longer, like say it's a centimeter, then every time you step on your knee, you're gonna pull the inner portion or inner leaflet of that meniscus tear away from the outer portion and you'll break down the uh, attempts of the body to heal it. And that you potentially need to have surgery for. Okay, New India is 24 years old, by the way. Yeah, so, so you have the potential for this to heal surgically. So it's going to depend on the length of the tear. So if it's more than seven or eight millimeters, I would be thinking that you should be getting surgery. Okay, cool. All right, next up. This one's general knee stiffness. It's from Darlene. I'm having an MRI next week. My left knee is swelling up, but it's not painful. Just stiff thoughts. How old is Darlene? Uh, Darlene, maybe you can let us know. It's not in the comments here. 
Um, so, okay. So the first thing is having an MRI for a knee that isn't painful um, and is just swelling um, is a common go-to thing uh, in this day and age. And um, a lot is going to depend on your age, but if you're over the age of, let's say you're over the age of 50, let's see, what do we say? 50, you're going to have a 25% chance of finding a meniscus tear. If you're over 60, you're going to have a 35% chance of finding a meniscus tear and so on. And if you have arthritis in there as well, you're going to have at least a 60% chance of finding a meniscus tear. Now, the fact that you have no pain, that meniscus tear could just be like a red herring. So it's so important that you actually correlate the findings on an MRI with what your symptoms are. And based on your symptoms right now, I would be suggesting get control of your swelling, get your VMO firing. Cause what happens as soon as your knee swells up, your VMO shuts off. And the longer the knee stays swollen, then the more uh, chances you are, or more chance you have that the tissues will become less pliable and you'll lose mobility. Um, if the, if the swelling hangs around, you'd be a great candidate for the knee recovery program because it teaches you exactly the stages that you can go through to control the swelling. Um, but I would be leery about anything, you know, they find a meniscus tear and you're not having any pain. Um, I, I would be, I would not be rushing in to have surgery. <laughs> okay. Darlene is 54 going on to 55 and she's a triathlete, lots of years of endurance sport. Yeah. So, you know, what could have happened? It could be that you have, it, it's really hard to know, but let's say you have a little wear and tear in your knee um, and a little piece of cartilage fell off and it can cause this inflammatory response. And um, it could have been from under your patella. It could, I, I don't know the alignment of your knee, you know, I'd have to kind of see that, but these things happen. And so the key thing is to control your swelling right now, uh, Darlene, and, and rushing into an MRI and, you know, treatment based on the MRI um, can be can be problematic, I believe. Look at this study, you know, like let's, well, A, if you wait long enough, wait, you wait a few weeks, maybe the pain and swelling are going to be gone, or the swelling is going to be gone, and, and you won't want to have anything done. But you need to really um, put the MRI results into context. And I think, um, why don't you give Darlene some of your, your top swelling, control the swelling tips. And this is all in the new recovery program. And I would say, I think it's a no brainer to get the program and to get started on it mm -hmm. because you're, you're not only addressing the swelling, which is part of the relaxed phase, phase one of the four phase program. Um, but then you're going to get other exercises that will potentially address any issues you have at the foot or the ankle or the hip that are contributing to that swelling. So doc, what do you think about swelling? The, the key thing is to get the VMO firing. So the VMO is the inner portion of the quadricep muscle. And it's hard to actually fire in isolation, <laughs> as Eric found out when we shot these videos, even when you don't have any pain or swelling in your knee. Um, but I, I found it a really important um, functional, com uh, functional um, component for people to recover and decrease the amount of swelling they had in their knee. So I would have patients right after surgery, I'd, they'd be in the recovery room. And actually I would teach them to try and teach them to do this before surgery. So they already knew how to do it. And in recovery room, I would have them waken up their VMO and you can do that by tapping uh, the VMO. And when you touch it, you're giving a little proprioceptive feedback, which kind of wakens the muscle up. And um, you, can, you can place your knee over a towel or a small pillow. You can bring your foot into sort of 90 degrees of dorsiflexion. And then you, what you try to do is to get your VMO to turn on and contract. And then you just lift your heel off the bed. You don't lift your knee off the pillow. You keep your knee on the pillow and you just you lift your heel off of the, the couch or the floor or wherever you are. And you lock out the knee straight. And if you can do that, what happens is it seems to kind of flush the fluid and congestion of the tissues um, around the knee and it prevents the knee from swelling any further. Um, and um, I find that um, uh, it's the single most important thing that you can do when you have a swollen knee. And then I would combine that with ice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, if you get the knee recovery program, you'll see that video. We left it intact of me and Doc I'm on the table 
and she's describing the exercise, the VMO exercise. We didn't practice this beforehand. Um, and she's telling me to activate my VMO. And we're both staring at my knee and nothing <laughs> is happening. We're staring for about two minutes, I think. And we're just like, okay, maybe we should just cut this and uh, try this out. But now I would say I'm a VMO master now because um, I, I took a, after that video shoot, I, uh, I did that exercise VMO activation probably every hour for the next two days. <laughs> and then I just kept doing it over and over. And now it's, it's no problem. I can kind of bounce them. You know, how the old bodybuilders like to bounce their pecs. I could kind yeah. of bounce them now and could really, I have good control and awareness of them. And I've, we've come up with new exercises actually as well for, for strengthening and activating that, that sucker. So those are in the program as well. Okay, so that is Darlene. Darlene, hopefully that's helpful. Uh, next up we have, this is a question about asking about the knee recovery program. Is it suitable for damaged cartilage in both knees? This, Vicky, this is from Vicky, she's hoping to do it. Uh, she's 47 years old, has daily swelling above both knees and possible scar tissue in one knee. I think it'd be a good program for you. Um, the cartilage damage, I'm assuming, is going to be articular cartilage damage, possibly meniscus cartilage, a little hard to know, but it covers really both of those wear and tear situations and um, will help improve the pliability um, of your tissues. Uh, and, and that's the goal of the program. So uh, I think that you would benefit well. Cool. And just a quick note, Doc, I think your mic is rubbing on your collar a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a little fuzzy. Yeah, I must be excited today. Yeah, it's an exciting topic. Meniscus tears. <laughs> I'm surprised you're still sitting. <laughs> okay, next up we have, uh, this is from Susanna, your friend Susanna. Oh, hi, Susanna. Should I be doing squats with osteoarthritis? If not, what is the best exercise you'd recommend? And in the description, there's, I was referring to patellofemoral pain. Um, I'm not sure what, maybe you can clarify on that, Susanna, but first off, squats with osteoarthritis? I think if you can do the squat and you don't have pain and swelling that you should do the squat. Now, if you're having pain and you're having anterior knee pain, um, we actually have a blog, I think that's it really covers this in a lot of detail. Uh, and there's some modifications that, you know, you, you need to make, but you, you'd have to look at your mobility of your ankle. You have to look at the, the strength and mobility in your hips to make sure that you're technically doing the squat properly. So I wouldn't recommend doing a squat if you're actually experiencing pain. Um, you need to then address why your knee is being overloaded with the squat motion and try to correct that. Uh, and if you can only do a quarter squat, then you do a quarter squat. Um, but what would you say to this, uh, Eric? Yeah, there's a couple of things I, I would mention about this. One is, this question is probably coming out because maybe it's irritating a little bit when the squat is being performed. Otherwise, it probably wouldn't uh, have the question. Susanna probably wouldn't have the question in the first place. So I'm just going to assume that there's a little irritation there. Uh, one thing that a couple points that are often taught with squatting. One, keep your knee. So if you're looking at the side of the body, this is my the side of my body. This is my leg. When you squat down, the knee. This is a terrible example. Um, <laughs> the cue is keep your knee behind your toes. So don't let your knees go forward in front of your toes if you're looking down at your knees from above. So that cue forces your hips back. But the problem is it takes out some of the foot and the ankle from the squat motion. And all of the force then goes through the knee. And it really puts a lot of stress on the quadricep. So that is going to put a lot of excess force going through the knee as opposed to if you let the knee go forward over the toe, then you're going to distribute the force amongst the foot. So the arch muscles and the calf and the knee, of course, it's going to go through the knee and the hip. So you're just going to distribute those forces amongst more joints than if you really try to drive your butt back and keep your knees behind your toes. Because when you keep your knees behind your toes, your foot is not a part of the equation anymore because you're sitting back on your heels. That's the second cue. Sit back on your heels. Don't really go on your toes. All your weight's through your heels when you're pushing up. Um, that is okay. If you're trying to do a max squat and you're a power lifter and you're just trying to you know, squat a thousand pounds, then you, you actually definitely need to do that. But if you're a regular person, if you're an athlete even, you need to in 
integrate your foot into this squat motion because that becomes more functional. It strengthens the arch muscles of your feet and it distributes the load across more joints to you take off some of the load from the knee. So those are two cues that are very common. Push the butt back so your knees don't go in front of your toes and push through the heels. That if you've got knee issues, I think it's distribute your weight evenly between heel and forefoot. So make sure that the, the foot is on so you get that arch. So you try to shorten the foot, metatarsal pressure. I talk about that a lot. We talk about that a lot. Um, make sure you're pushing down through the metatarsals as well. And then have the knees go in front of the toes. Allow them to do that. Make it a natural motion. Don't drive them forward um, purposefully, but make it a natural motion so that you're distributing the load across your ankle, your knee, and your hip. So those are kind of the pointers that come to mind when I hear uh, that kind of comment about squats and knee pain in general. I actually lived this. I had some, I, I was having really significant problems with anterior knee pain and um, you changed my biomechanics with this and it made a huge difference. And uh, I'm really excited. So thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. You're very welcome. And it's really weird to feel my foot actually in action. You know, mm. I feel my foot pulling, pulling me up actually more from a lunge than a squat. Yeah. But um, it's, it, it's, uh, it's cool how even at 61, you can wake up parts of your body and, and strengthen. And, you know, I'm sure I've got some arthritis on a knee x-ray if I was to get one. Um, and uh, my knees don't hurt now. It's fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So Susanna, hopefully that's helpful. Those tips there. Um, next up, we have Wendy. She's asked about the knee recovery program. Will it help with medial patella facet degeneration with cartilage damage and subchondrial signal change. Yes, I think it'd be a good program because we teach a lot about how to work on the pliability of the tissue around your kneecap. And um, we do also quite a bit of work on tibial rotation. So if you, if you um, keep your, if you're, when you're sitting here, if you keep your knees your hips at 90, your knee at 90, and then you just rotate your foot to the outside, and then you can rotate your foot to the, to, towards each other. So away from one another and then towards each other, you're rotating your tibia on your femur. And this is a really important action that we lose. And I think plays a very crucial role for patients with meniscus pathology and with patellofemoral problems. And so we've got some great uh, little drills um, to, to work on that. And there's, if any of you have ROM coach, there's, um, what's the name of, you're gonna have to help me, Eric, cause I'm terrible with the names of the exercises, but it's the, it's when you're lying on your back and uh, you have your, your hip at 90, knee yeah, is, that's, only, yeah, what's supine, that one called? That's the supine tibial rotation. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great, great exercise. Um, for people with patellofemoral meniscus OA problems, um, and 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 so I think that um, I think that what this will do is hopefully take the pressure off that medial facet of your patella and distribute the load across your whole patella and balance the patella. Um, so that's sort of the local things that we do. But then we'll get your foot and ankle muscles woken up in your hip. And so you sort of deal with both of those um, uh, joints as well to, to really ice the cake and, and keep your patella healthy. Okay, cool, thank you. Next up, let's go back to meniscus tears. This is from Whistle Whistle. Uh, it's a little bit of a story here. Meniscus slight horizontal tear five years ago, Europe uh, I can't read that. Knee had two ACL surgery six years ago. There's constant knee clicking and tibia wobbliness. Squat worsens it. Glute activation exercises and transverse and frontal plane seem to greatly help, but not completely. So it seems quads somehow make it worse. Glutes improve. Hamstrings and calves roll is doubtful. So just a comment. What I just said about squats, uh, that definitely applies to you. Um, and then how come? And keep in mind what else can be done other than already mentioned. Plus, it's doing single leg strengthening, foam rolling, and dynamic mobility. 25 years old. Okay, so um, 
this is a complex knee problem because you've already had two ACL reconstructions. And the first thing that comes to my mind is why did the ACL, so A, why did the ACL tear in the first place? You have it fixed. And then why did it tear in the second place? Did, so if you have movement dysfunction that leads to overload of the ACL, you tear your ACL, you go and you have surgery to fix the ACL, but then you don't change how you're moving and your movement dysfunction then tears your repair. So that's the first thing I think. Um, and so I'm curious as to whether we've really been able to get to the root of your movement dysfunction as to why you're overloading your knee. And so we've got to get you going with your foot and ankle and your hip. And I would be focusing on those two more than anything. A horizontal tear in the meniscus. So that's not likely going to be flipping in and out of the joint and locking. I would not be paying much attention to that as causing the wobbliness. The wobbliness, I think, could either be that your ACL is, you, you probably have the ligament reconstruction there, but your dynamic stabilizers are not really doing their job. And so your focus needs to be on improving your proprioception uh, and in making sure that your, your hip, knee, foot, and ankle are all working together in the way that they need to be. Okay, I got a couple of comments here from Whistle Whistle. The second tear was too soon playing. Uh, what sport were you playing? Were you soccer is a common one for ACL tears or basketball. Those are very common. Um, second comment here was squat form is perfect. I, I would question that. <laughs> I am, I am a really, really stringent on form when I'm training people. So I, I would question that. And then second comment is lunge, lunges also do worse in it. So that tells me, yeah, that when you're squatting, your quads are, are doing a lot. You're involving your quads a ton. Second tear was too soon playing. The hamstrings play a huge role in stabilizing your knee, especially for ACL tears, preventing ACL tears. So if your squat, if your lunges are worsening your pain, then your hamstrings are likely not active much or to the extent that they need to be to stabilize your knee um, and the quads are just dominating that movement pattern same with squats and likely your hamstrings weren't developed and and working well uh, possibly contributing to the acl tear in the first place well it's very well demonstrated that people that are quad dominant are higher uh at higher risk for acl tears so th this is uh your squat form here's the other, another thing your squat form can look look great but it's what's going on inside and that's why i use the term map or movement and and or activation pattern because the movement pattern might look beautiful somebody's just checking it out see it on video it's great but what's happening internally is your foot are your foot muscles engaged are your hamstrings engaged and when you have your foot muscles engaged that engages your calves as well like your gastrocnemius which the knee joint this is the knee joint the hamstrings go like that the calves the gastrocnemius goes like that when those two muscles are on, they help to cinch the knee to increase the stability of the knee. So is that happening? You can't see that stuff, but you've got to know internally and you've got to be coached through that with the proper cueing and exercises. So I think there's a, there's a lot you could work on. And because you're young, only 25, um, you could fix all of these issues pretty relatively quickly and you know, stabilize that knee so you can get back to your, whatever it is you love doing. Uh, with some confidence that, you know, you're not just going to blow your ACL if you cut to kick a soccer ball or, or shoot a basket. You know, Eric, actually, the, the fact, whistle, whistle, that you're 25, you're probably compensating in ways that you don't know. You're probably so strong uh, that yeah. you don't actually realize that you're compensating. And, you know, I see these really young 25, really, really strong. And you can, exactly what you said, you can go through the movement pattern, but you're not actually activating the muscles that need to be on because you're so strong with your quads, for example, but then that's why you're getting the pain. That's the, that's the signal. So we won't argue that you look perfect, but let's make sure that you get the, let's get the right muscles working so that you feel perfect. And uh, I'm excited for you. Cause I think if you can get on this, you'll really, you'll really improve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think um, for you, the knee recovery program is going to help you to set that foundation. I definitely recommend that. It might seem really easy to you, especially if you're an athlete and you're, you are strong and powerful, but it's going to build up those little things that 
you never worked before you got to squats. Like, is your VMO firing properly? And all these other elements and factors that we address in the program. So check it out. If there's a, a link or we'll have Josh or you post the link. So it's up here, uh, up high in the chat. Okay, next up. Uh, this is from actually a knee recovery program uh, customer. So this one, you know what? This is about 2000 words. So I'm gonna put this one off because I don't, I don't think I'm gonna read that right now. That's okay. a little bit, uh, we'll, we'll address that at another, another time. Here's one, can reactivation of hamstring help knee alignment? This is from Karsten. 100%. And Eric, I'm gonna let you take over this because you're, you're amazing with, uh, with the activation patterns. Cool, thank you. Um, yeah, I think we, we just talked about it a little bit, how the hamstring contributes to stability for sure. Um, what would you say in terms of alignment, knee alignment? Does it have an effect on alignment of patella or femur over tibia? Oh, for sure, because you've got uh, you've got different parts of the hamstring. So you've got part of the hamstring inserts on the medial tibia, and you've got part of the hamstring that inserts laterally on the fibula. So it can actually affect the tibial rotation, and um, that can that affects the position of your foot potentially in relation to your knee and your hip. So if you've got one part, like, you know, say the biceps, which is the outside part of your hamstring gets too tight, um, then you can pull the alignment off uh, or vice versa, you know, if the, if the medial side is too tight. So very important, I guess, to not only have the hamstring turned on, but to have it balanced um, and making sure that you're using all of it um, and this is where active self myofascial release, getting a ball, getting the ball between the various portions of the hamstring as, and you teach this, um, Eric, and, and how, you know, you move the ball and you're actively, uh, you're sitting on a ball. So the ball's on your hamstring and then you're extending your knee and, uh, you know, releasing the ham, the various parts of the hamstring, um, is very important. So. I guess the short answer is yes, the hamstring does have an important role in alignment. And um, I think that also, you know, you have to think why has the one part of the bicep, you know, the hamstring gotten tight versus another? And how is that affected by metatarsal pressure? I believe very commonly how you're putting your foot down. Uh, if you're not putting your foot down and you don't have good metatarsal pressure that is evenly distributed, say you're more on the outside of your foot, you're gonna be engaging muscles along the posterior chain differently than if you have your foot balanced on the ground. Mm -hmm. Right on. Yeah, flat feet and overpronation in particular is gonna um, affect the alignment of the knee via hamstring lengthening on one side and kind of shortening on the other. So uh, yeah, so for sure affects the alignment there. And then you know, the second part of this question was, he has a partial tear or wear out of meniscus. And it's, he's mentioning it seems to be helped by realigning the knee by pulling on the hamstring. And so he's asking, can reactivation of hamstring help the alignment? So yes, definitely. Um, and I'm just gonna direct you to a link. It's in the resources section in the description here on this video. Um, it's the five advanced knee stability exercises and in brackets, great for torn meniscus rehab. And okay. this is where you're going to, these are the exercises actually I'm using right now. Some of the exercises I'm using right now to restore that last little bit of passive range of motion. Um, I'm using active exercises where I'm activating my hamstrings to get that passive motion, as opposed to just reefing on my quads, you know, the old quad stretch where you grab your ankle and pull your butt heel to your butt. Reefing on it like that is probably just going to damage the meniscus further. Um, but when you do the active exercise, like I'm showing in that video, then you're, you're pretty safe. Like you're going to get to the point where you can only get to safely. And then you won't be able to activate or get any deeper. So check that video out. Uh, that'll probably help you to, to take what you already know, which is pretty cool. You already have figured this out on your own. Um, it'll take that to, to another level with some other techniques. Okay. Now this one, medial meniscus tear from cell. 
My MRI showed grade one medial meniscus tear at the posterior horn. It happened six months ago. Never had pain or swelling, but I was feeling pressure above and around the knee. My doctor said no surgery. What do you say? She's saying she finished the old meniscus program, which is the knee recovery program now. We've just updated it. And I still feel some pressure less than three months ago, but still. Okay, so um, first of all, a grade one tear on an MRI. So if we were to look at the meniscus like a triangle, a grade one tear means that there's degeneration in the center of the meniscus that doesn't actually come out to the surface of the meniscus itself. So it would be, if we were to look arthroscopically, we would not see any tear. Um, but if I put a probe onto the meniscus, I could feel it and it would feel a little soft. So it wouldn't feel like firm and um, in normal. So it's the beginning of a degenerative process. What I would like you to do is to um, focus a lot on mobilizing the um, PEZ from the, so that's the hamstrings on the inside of your knee from the knee capsule and the MCL. And you can basically just kind of stick your fingers around them and hold on to them and then flex and extend your knee. And um, because sometimes what happens if that tissue sticks to the uh, capsule, then it'll hold the meniscus when you're flexing and extending. And that might be the last little bit of um, release that you need to improve the tissue pliability and, um, and, and get over the hump. And I would really also focus on the tibial rotation exercises that we were talking about earlier. Um, I think that would help you a lot. And, mm -hmm. and, and in particular, um, that exercise will help with the flexibility and pliability and length of the hamstring. Uh, so that's a, that's a perfect exercise for you to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that can be found, let me think. Uh, I think it's found in the three simple exercises for knee pain relief, I believe. It's in ROM Coach, the supine tibial rotations exercise. You can see it in the exercise library there. Um, and it's in it's the, in the knee. knee recovery program for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's sprinkled throughout yep. various courses and programs and things that we have out there. Uh, so you should be able to find that no problem. Okay. I'm just checking on the time here and the amount of questions that we have. It's 102. We are going to go till 110 today. Um, so what we'll do next week, if you have not gotten your question answered, we will save, we have them all saved. We're going to just do meniscus because there's no way we're going to get through all these. Okay. Uh, today. So we'll do come back next week, Thursday at noon Eastern. Make sure you like and subscribe here on YouTube so you get notified of uh, when we go live. But it's thir Thursday at noon Eastern. Um, and we will just start running through the questions because we want to try to help everybody uh, with this issue. It's such a common issue. And it's so yep. uh, manageable when you're doing the right things that we want to get you on the right path. So let's get back on track here. Yael is asking, my mom had meniscus surgery that did not turn out well. Her leg collapsed completely at the knee. Now her hip is damaged and her whole spine because of the imbalance from surgery. Um, so it's just a comment there. Is there any, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, Anything that this lady can do? I'm not quite sure how the knee collapsed, um, but I would be just working on very general principles here of you know, looking at the foot and ankle, the knee and the hip. And if the knee is really, really painful right now, um, the key is to uh, start here at the knee recovery program level to work on tissue pliability and getting the VMO activated. A lot of times I find that people will, if they're worse after they have meniscus surgery or worse after a scope or um, particularly ACLs, we see this, it's a condition called arthrofibrosis where the kneecap gets captured in this inflammatory fibro, fibro inflammatory tissue. And then the kneecap doesn't glide up and down in its groove the way that it should. And the person walks on a bent knee. And then that really loads the patella and the patella wears out. And then you're, when you're walking on a bent knee, obviously you're compensating and affecting your, 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 your hip and your back and, and everything. So this is gonna take some time. It's going to take patience. The key is to mobilize the patella. Um, you, 
and we teach that in the program. And basically the way you do it is you put your leg out straight and relax the quadricep. And then you grab the kneecap from the sides. If you push down onto your knee, it can be painful. So you grab it from the sides and you try to kind of very gently move it up and down. And then you turn the VMO on to pull the kneecap up towards your head. And that's one of the key things. Whenever you've got tissue that doesn't move properly, you want to mobilize it and then activate or be activating and mobilizing at the same time. So in this situation, it sounds like she'd probably have trouble just turning on her quad. So let's do a little bit of passive mobilization of the patella and then turn the quad on to gain the length because we're trying to get that kneecap moving up and down in its groove so that you can use your quadricep to walk better. Cool. Thank you. Okay. From Dane, is this a meniscus tear? 71 year old male, palpation reveals no hot spot, but going on all fours at the right angle will cause very sharp pain. Could that be a meniscus tear? It improves with weeks of rest and no activation. Uh, it depends where the pain is. Like if that pain on all fours is under the kneecap or at the front of the knee, I would say it's more likely related to the patella. Um, if you're on all fours and it's a very sharp pain on the side, it could be. Um, and if you have, but we know that if you're, you know, at the age of 70, you've got a 45% chance of having a meniscus tear regardless. So Flip even if you, don't, <laughs> if you don't have any arthritis, there's a chance that you have a meniscus tear. And so there's something that's going on that's uh, probably a tissue pliability issue and muscle activation. So you need to kind of focus on getting all of the tissues loose and elastic and all the right muscles working. Um, follow the principles we've talked about today and I think it can make a difference for you. Okay, cool. And uh, in terms of tests, uh, sometimes just that tibial rotation movement, uh, I've showed that before. When you do the tibial rotation, if you really try to go deep into the rotation, rotating laterally or medially, um, you can, if you detect pain with that movement, then that might indicate meniscus tear. Um, but regardless, there's a good chance you have one anyway. And the principle of the exercises that we've talked about here and the programs that we've talked about um, are, are gonna get you shored up for whether it's a meniscus tear, ACL problem, patel patellofemoral pain syndrome, patellar maltracking. Um, all those issues. And I think you touched on this at the beginning, but I just wanted to, I forgot to, to further your comment. You, you posed the question, how can, you know, this one program address all of these different issues? Mm -hmm. And the other point I wanted to make about that is because we could have, two people could have this exact same dysfunction. Let's say they lack dorsiflexion of the ankle, the, where the angle at the front of the ankle closes, that's dorsiflexion. They lack that. The problem that could come up could be Achilles tendinopathy, could be any of those patellar issues, could be a hamstring tear, could be an ACL tear, meniscus tear. Lots of different things can happen. And the reason why is because our structure is all different and our movement patterns are all different. And the activities that we perform are all different on a regular basis, especially those repetitive activities. If you play a different sport, for sure, you can just picture that. So what breaks down um, will differ, but the same root cause could cause that uh, tissue, different tissues to break down in different people because of all the variables that I just mentioned. So that's why the, core, the program that we've put together addresses the common dysfunctions and deficiencies that lead to all these myriad different issues. So I just wanted to, to further that comment that you, you made earlier on that. You know, that's great. And thanks for doing that. And, and it's actually... A lot of, I think people will also maybe get a little confused with, you know, is it arthritis or is it maltracking or is it a meniscus tear or is it like a, um, a chondral lesion, you know, like the chondromalacia. There's all these different terms that doctors use to try and pigeonhole a pathology. The bottom line is all of that is wear and tear pathology and your sort of little syndrome that we're pigeonholing in is a matter of a wear and tear problem. And we need to use the principles of align, balance and correct muscles 
um, using the four R's to treat it, no matter what we call it. Right on. Okay, so last question here. Sorry for not being able to answer everybody's question today, but looking at it, we have about 14 other questions that we can get to about menis mostly meniscus tears. And well, that's pain. awesome. Yeah, yeah, thank you everybody for coming with your questions because everybody learns from it. So it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. It's not awesome that you have pain or problems. No, but no, no, no. <laughs> it's awesome that you're here asking your question. <laughs> no, that's um, true. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> just in case anybody was confused about that. Oh, you know, like the surgeons, we always just want people to be broken so we can operate on them. <laughs> Some surgeons. Not yeah, all. not me. Not me. Not I'm, I'm, a, I'm an exception, actually. Yeah. Okay, so the last one, it's Watts, Watts, 39 years old, uh, lingering right knee pain. MRI didn't show any tears. X-ray showed arthritis in the kneecap. Really impacts things like skiing, running, and playing with kids. Um, doctors keep telling me nothing was wrong, but my right clearly feels different than my left, which never bothers me. What are some suggestions? Don't want to make it worse. Doesn't want to make it worse. So first of all, it's good news that structurally things look good on an MRI, but I'm sorry that people have said to you there's nothing wrong because there's obviously something wrong or you wouldn't have the pain. So you know, there's some kind of imbalance or dysfunction that's going on in your movement. And um, just as a generalization, without having any more details, you have to follow the principles that we've talked about today, or that's what I, you don't have to, but that's what I would recommend uh, of getting the foot and ankle uh, mobilized, engaging the intrinsic muscles of your foot, making sure you have good metatarsal pressure making sure that your kneecap is moving properly and that you've got good pliability of the tissues around the knee and similarly around the hip, because all three of those joints are just working synergistically. And, um, you know, if you have, it, it, I think it really depends on how much pain you have, whether you would go into the knee recovery program, if you have no swelling and really not too much pain, like if we were to look at a numeric pain rating scale, if zero is no pain and 10 is such severe pain that you'd be crawling to the eMERGE. If your pain is a three or a less and you have no swelling in this situation, you might think about lower limb control as the course to go to because it can just take you through the progressions. But if you really are struggling um, with pain and swelling, then you need to start in the knee recovery program just to get you the foundation so you're comfortable to then go into lower limb control. Yeah, right on. And I think it's, you know, at your age, and it sounds like you, you like to be active. Um, it'll be a journey through, you know, first you start with your foot, your ankle, your knee, and you move up, okay, now I gotta work on my hip and my core. And then it's like, oh, you know, I might as well deal with my shoulder stuff. Um, and that's why we have courses that are targeted towards the joints. Because while it would be great to do everything all at once, you can't do that effectively nor do we have the time to do that effectively. So that's why we've organized the courses through different areas. But if you have a knee problem, you gotta go to the foot and ankle, you gotta go to the hip. If you have a shoulder problem, you gotta look at the neck and the core, as well as the shoulder and even the elbow. So you've always gotta be moving around. And you know, if we're, we're in this for the, the long term, we wanna be keep, you wanna keep skiing and running when you're 80, you know, not just for the next few years. Mm -hmm. um, at some point, go through all of the courses, all the programs, just so you address those root dysfunctions that could cause something else that's completely unrelated to anything you have right now, it could cause something else in the future. So, um, okay, that is all the time we have today, folks. Um, apologies to all the people waiting. I know we've got some questions from New India, Sharon, Alex, Chrysanth, Noreen, Dane, uh, Art, Art Muir, Chris, so all your questions, I just read them in our tracker here. We're gonna cover them. We're gonna start with them next week where we'll just fire up uh, the meniscus questions again. No presentation, we'll just dive right in and hopefully we can get you all answered. And a couple of things I wanted to mention. Um, first up, the knee recovery program, like we mentioned earlier, it's on sale now until Monday, I believe it is. So get in now and that's also the last date when you can choose to participate in our study, our formal study. So this, by participating in the study, you're also gonna get a little more guidance 
Uh, you're going to get a little more awareness and insight into your issue by going through the questionnaire, the COOS that Dr. B talked about earlier. Uh, so that was a, a great time just to get into the program. You'll be doing it with a bunch of other people at the same time um, around the world. So we might have you know little emails that come out when we get good questions from the group. So check that out. The link will be the link is in the description, and we'll throw it in the chat right now. And come back next week. Make sure you subscribe to the channel so you can come back and see us at Thursday at noon. And uh, I just wanted to share one thing. This right here, for those of you who know I had a baby boy, uh, that's him. That's basically what he's been up to for the past three and a half weeks, almost four weeks. His name is Zachary, Zachary Richmond. And uh, yeah, he's a good little guy. He's nice beautiful. Yeah, he's beautiful. He's looking good there. I got some other <laughs> pictures and videos that I'll show you where he's not looking as peaceful as that. Um, but yeah, for those of you who like babies, that's him. He's been a joy. And wow. uh, yeah, that's it. So Doc, as always, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your your caringness, caring with everybody. And My I look pleasure. forward to talking to you next week. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. See you next week, everybody. Take care. Bye.